Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is Crank Divers. Hello everybody, welcome to today's episode. Hello everyone. So Jill, where in the world are we today? We're in the UK. In the UK, awesome. And what's the title? The Jigsaw Killer. Ooh, The Jigsaw Killer. Mm-hmm. Interesting title. Mm. I know, but I've actually saw somebody else do a podcast that had the same name or it was The Jigsaw Murder or something along those lines. And I was like, oh no, we're doing that one. And then I realised it's actually a different person, so I don't actually know who that other person is. Oh, but oh. So there must be more than one. But Fair anyway, enough. obviously we have the name here, yes, so... this is what we're doing. Excellent. We can't get them confused. No. So we're ready to dive in? Yeah, let's dive in. So, on the 22nd of March, 2009, in Cotterid, Hertfordshire, in England, a farmer called Roger Kingsley was going about his daily routine. He started cultivating one of the fields with his tractor at 7.30 that morning, and after a little while, he noticed a bag at the bottom of the field. So he thought to himself, oh, you know, I'll, I'll pick that up at some point today, otherwise it'll just, like get caught up when we're cutting hedges or like doing some sort of other jobs but he wasn't that close to it at that point so he could see it Mm -hmm. because although it says it's at the bottom of the field from i think it actually was sort of over a fence at the bottom of the field i think it was like in a sort of lay-by kind of thing and he must have been able to see it through through Mm -hmm. the fence i think that's kind of the the impression that i got so he just you know went about his day didn't think anything more of it till later on that afternoon and when he saw it again and he was closer to it so he jumped off the tractor with the dogs to go and have a look. So the bag was a green hold all, and when Roger unzipped it, there was something inside wrapped in blue builder's plastic. So he touched it, and in his words, his finger squidged in it. Mm. So it obviously wasn't a hard object. Uh-huh, yeah. So Roger was like, mm, okay, like I, I don't think I want to go any further. Uh, yeah. I don't think I want to kind of look. Well, I mean, I must admit, I mean... A hold all at a field, you kind of think it could be quite suspicious. I mean, maybe there's innocent times where it's just nothing. It, yeah, but if something's wrapped up and it feels a bit yeah. squidgy, then I think I'd be the same as I would be like uh, the same as Roger, and I'd I be can't like, look at that anymore. Yeah, touch it, or I need somebody else to do it. <laughs> exactly. So he just called the local police, you know, and said to them, you know, could you could you come and have a look, you yeah. know? So a team of officers, like, you know, came and met him at the field. So one of the officers opened the bag. He put his hand in and he felt around and then he looked at one of his colleagues and said, I think it's got toes on it. Oh. So once they realised what was in the bag, uh-huh. they shut the road off. Most of the village was all shut off for that night and the next morning. So Roger found what turned out to be a human left leg. Right. But there was nothing else suspicious at the scene. You know, it was just... Just that bag. With a left leg in it. With a left leg in it. I mean, like, I, I mean, and there was nothing else suspicious as in it's obviously just been put there, you yeah. know. Whatever's happened not happened. Then. Yeah, exactly. So the case was being handled by officers from the Bedfordshire and Her- Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit. And at first, like, they didn't really know what they were dealing with because they were like, well, we've only got one leg. Is this, are we going to find more? Is it this one, is it going to be one person? Or is it going to be more than, you know, yeah. what? What is this? Mm. So one officer, Detective Superintendent Michael Hanlon, who was the senior investigating officer, said that what was unusual about it was the scale that the leg had been removed from the body. So it had been done quite well, which we'll, uh-huh. which I'll get into mm-hmm. uh, later on. Um, well, I'll sort of get a bit into it now, but we get properly into yeah. it later on. So they had to get a specialist home office pathologist and an anthropologist to give them an informed view as to whether it was a medical amputation or not. Because, well, somebody might have stole it from a hospital or something, you know, that's right, okay, part of why yeah. they didn't know what they were yeah, dealing with as well. It seems ridiculous, but... Yeah, I, I know, but you just <laughs> you have know. to go down all avenues, yeah, I suppose. Course, yeah, so, but because there was no cauterisation of blood veins and arteries, then there was no indication that it was a medical amputation. Mm-hmm. So once they drilled that out, they are like, right, this is a murder inquiry, so they've got a little bit more idea now. Yeah. So Operation Abnet was launched, but the key was to find in the perpetrator was to find out who the victim was first. Uh-huh. 
did you find that from a left leg? Well, exactly. So, you know, as, because as we know, the majority of people who murder, they murder people they know, the majority of murders. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so the officers needed to build up a really clear picture and identify who the victim was. Then surely that would give them a number of lines of inquiry to in- identify the murderer. Yeah. But because the victim's DNA, because obviously the put the DNA into the database, it, what, it, the victim's DNA wasn't on the yeah. database, so it made it really mean, hard. Just from looking at the leg, they would hopefully be able to tell whether it's male or female. No. No? But Are we'll they? get to that as well. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought, you know, I've seen, like, men's feet especially, and legs and the hairiness maybe they have, and... Well... No? Oh, okay. No, they they didn't, they couldn't tell whether it was male or female till later. Oh, right, okay. I thought that would just be quite obvious, but <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> No, not in this case. I mean, you would think it would be, but not in this case. Mm-hmm. So on the 29th of March, um, a member of the public found a left forearm on a quiet country road in a village called Wheat Hampstead, which was 25 miles away from where the leg was found. Mm-hmm. So the police were looking into missing persons records, but without being able to identify the age or even the gender from the body parts, it was proven really difficult. Mm-hmm. So... With no identity, there was no obvious motive. In the absence of even a murder scene, because they didn't even know where you know where that was, yeah. it left the police very little to go on. But while inquiries were taking place in Hertfordshire, the case was about to open up on a much wider scale with a new discovery almost 100 miles north in Leicestershire. All right. So on the 31st of March, a human head was discovered by a farmer in his field in a place called Asford Bay near Melton Mowbray. So this head... Ha, sorry, I should have put, really put a bit of a trigger warning that in this episode is uh-huh. there's going to be quite a lot of um, talking about body parts and um, dismembering and things yeah. like that. Lovely. So well, there's I your trigger. I get that well, story, yeah, I know. I, sh- I should have really said that at the start. So anyway, so because this is a bit... Mm. So this head had its face removed. Huh? So there was no eyes, no mouth... No nose, no tongue, and no ears. Oh, yuck. So, the leg and arm had been found on the 22nd and the 29th of March okay. in Hertfordshire, mm-hmm. 25 miles, they'd been 25 miles apart, and the head was found on the 31st of March in Leicestershire, which was 100 miles away. Right. So, it was all quite close together. So, that was between the 22nd and the 31st of March. So, that was basically a week. Yeah. yeah. Just over a week. Uh-huh. Um. So officers beca- began a painstaking search of the area, looking for further evidence where the head had been found. Mm-hmm. At that time, they didn't know if the head was they didn't know if the head was linked, right? Okay. Because it was a hundred miles away yeah. from Hertford, Hertfordshire, uh-huh. so it could have just been a separate. Yeah, so DNA case. had proved that the arm and leg were the same person. Right. Um. So they obviously had to figure out if the head was from the same victim or if there were more than one victims. Uh-huh. So a couple of days after the head was found. DNA proved that it did belong to the same victim oh, wow. as right. the arm and leg. So this was just one person. Right, okay. So you might be kind of realising why it's called the jigsaw killer now because it was pieces of a jigsaw. Yeah, yeah That's yeah. why. Kind of yeah. yeah. So officers believed that the murderer or murderers had drove to the location and discarded the head in woodland that was next to the field. Mm-hmm. And it had prob- probably been carried into the field by animals. Right. So it may it may not have been found if the animals hadn't have taken it into the open, if it had just been like in yeah. the woodland, you know. Mm-hmm. Might, so luckily, yeah. the animals had taken it. It sounds weird saying luckily. I know, but I know what, I know what you mean. Like, just so it, so it could be found. Yeah. Um, so now the police had three body parts, all confirmed to be from the same victim, but they were still no closer to identifying them. And of um, course, the I just, I just I don't I mean obviously, I know I don't know much about stuff, but I just thought that you know like even like, I know it's not a very face, but even like the sort of shape of the skull or you know anything that you think that would indicate give an indication of of what was it male or female? Yep. So, um, don't know. You maybe lose my place now. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so that uh, so they were no closer to identifying the victim, and of course the state of the head didn't didn't help them. Mm-hmm. Much of the skin and the soft tissue had been removed and the police still, still didn't know if it belonged to a man or a woman. Right, okay. So they called in the help of a lady called uh, Sue Black and the forensic anthropology team at the University of Dundee, Dundee's Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification. So they sent a photograph of the head to Sue because Police actually, they did have a missing person in mind because they'd obviously been looking through the missing people, missing persons. Uh And they did have somebody in mind 
who wasn't in the vicinity, but ge geographically fairly close. And what they wanted to know was, could this head belong to this person, to this right. missing person? Mm -hmm. So the missing person was a young adult female. Mm -hmm. So they wondered if this head could belong to her. So as they sent a picture of obviously of the missing girl, mm -hmm. female as well. Mm -hmm. But the team looked and they were like, nah. This isn't your young ad. This isn't this 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 young adult female. This looks to us like a middle aged male. Right. Okay. So Sue and her colleague Luc Lucina Hackman had to deal with the task of figuring out what happened to this head. Their first thought when they looked at it was that there was no soft tissue and there was no evidence of de sorry decomposition. Mm -hmm. So they had to look at another method of loss of soft tissue in that situation. So they wondered if it had been an the animals that had found the head, right. if they removed the soft tissue, but there was like no obvious bite marks oh, okay. um, or, or any marks yeah. left really that any, like, so there wasn't any, any animal activity. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like, so if it wasn't animal activity, it had to be human intervention. Yeah. So assuming it was human intervention, they looked for cut marks and, and, and they actually did find cut marks. Right. So they found that the soft tissue had been removed from the head using a sharp implement and it had been very skillfully cut by the muscles attached to the bone. Oh, for somebody knows that somebody basically knew what they were doing then. Well, that's that's what it sounds like, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, like not, it's not like just being just a random sort of attack. It's like actually somebody that's like maybe thought this through and done it. Yeah, like, um, it's out, it's, I'm sorry, I'm, there's a dog barking outside. I'm just going to shut the window. I was trying to do that while Laura was talking and be quiet about it, but it just wasn't working, was it? Uh, it was not. Yeah, that dog is so annoying. <laughs> I have a few dogs in my street and they're all annoying. Anyway, no, I love dogs, but just not ones that are barking when I'm trying to do a podcast. No, they don't help. No, and that one was really annoying me. Anyway, sorry. So... There was confirmation, that was confirmation to them that they were really looking at a, detail, at a detailed, not just me dismemberment, but a disfigurement in relation to the head. Interestingly, the teeth were all left intact, mm -hmm. which they were surprised at because, as we know, teeth are commonly used as a method of identification. Yeah, totally, yeah. But as they had no dental records to compare, because the, they didn't know who it was, so they couldn't compare the dental yeah. records to anything. Mm -hmm. So they were no further forward, no. even though it had its teeth. Yeah. So, a week after the head was found, on the 7th of April, a right leg was discovered in Puckeridge in Hertfordshire. And a few days later, on the 11th of April, um, a suitcase containing a torso was recovered three miles south in a place called Ware. So, the same, uh, sorry, the new discoveries had the same DNA as the rest, and the torso provided the police with some key evidence. The torso um, showed that the cause of death had been a stab wound. To the back because right. obviously they, they couldn't find they, they, they had all these body parts but they're like how well, how they died yeah so that it was a stab wound right. so the man was believed to be of white asian or of mixed heritage between the heights of five foot six and five foot ten so since this search had been going on for nearly a month detective superintendent michael hanlon decided decided to change tack and use media exposure in search in the search for an identity so he had a they held a press conference and he said quote I'm dealing with a horrific, a horrific murder here. I need the public's help to ident help me identify who the victim is, egg quote. He also told the public that the victim was overweight, suffered from eczema, same, <laughs> and the overweight bits, actually, <laughs> had bleached skin pigmentation on his legs, a fungal infection on his toenails, and was missing two front teeth. He released a picture of the suitcase in which the torso was found, but decided to keep details of the dismemberment from the public to avoid panic. So, we, you know, they just um, gave all that information, yeah. which would be helpful, because if you know somebody who's missing, who uh, has all that, well, yeah, uh, exactly. you know, mm -hmm. the eczema, the missing two front teeth, yeah. all that kind of... Um, but it wasn't just the identity of the victim that the police were trying to establish. At a forensic science lab in Cambridgeshire, forensic scientist Ray Palmer was hoping to uncover more information about the murder itself and the culprits. So the first task in the investigation was to look at the debris which had been taken and recovered from all the de deposition sites, from all the packages that had been used to wrap up the body parts and to look at the debris to see if there was any associations between them and see if there was any evidence as to the environment that the victim had been. Seems like a lot of effort, the way to... 
But this is why this is why this case interested me because there's a lot more sort of details on how they managed to 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 identify the person to find uh, the murderer. It seems such an effort for that person to obviously they've killed somebody, which is shocking enough. But then they've decided to dismember them, and then scatter the body parts around. I mean, the bad like sort of hundred miles away was one of them. So mm-hmm. I mean, they've actually made a lot of effort to drive around them and dump all these body parts. Well, spoiler alert. They're not that bright. Oh, okay. Well, I'm assuming not. Because <laughs> to do all this, I, and you'd think they, they would really, really, obviously, we, I don't want to get discovered, mm. so I'm going to do this and I'm going to scatter the body and everything like that. Then they go on to, it goes on to do stupid things afterwards to actually find out. Oh. So basically, uh, there's no point. In, um, in fact, I'm going to shut up about the spoiler alert. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to get on. on. <laughs> so the fibre evidence would only prove useful once the police had discovered who the victim was and where he was murdered, but the forensic experts worked to find any evidence that would lead, lead police to the victim. The police started to get a response to their media appeals. So, And it was one particular phone call that was a, a key breakthrough. Someone called the incident room and explained that they had a family member missing and the description of the victim victim, sorry, sounded like him. Mm-hmm. The missing person was called Geoffrey Howe and he was 49 years old. He lived in Southgate, which is on the outskirts of North London. He worked as a kitchen salesman. He was described as a jovial, charming character who had a heart of gold and he'd been, he'd been married twice. He was, um, but he was single at the time of his um, disappearance. He was reported missing on the 16th of March by a friend. So officers were sent to Jeffrey's home address. And when they arrived, there was no sign of Jeffrey, but there were two people living at the property. And they were Jeffrey's tenants, 37-year-old Stephen Marshall and his 20-year-old girlfriend, Sarah Bush. Jeffrey and Stephen had worked together and um, at one point as partners in a kitchen fitting business. And in November 2008, Stephen and Sarah had fallen on hard times. So Jeffrey let them move into his spare room. They had agreed to pay rent, but shortly afterwards they had stopped making the payments and Jeffrey had asked them to leave, but they refused to go. Ding, 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 red flags. Mm-hmm, yeah. So anyway, um, the, the officers spoke to Sarah and Stephen, but they weren't happy with the account the pair gave to why Jeffrey wasn't there. Um, they'd kind of just said, oh, yeah, he just packed up and, and left, you know. Um, he's, just, he's just pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> and they said that Sarah and Stephen seemed nervous and evasive and that caused the officers concern. Yeah. So they did a quick search of the property and in one of the wardrobes they found a car registration plate mm-hmm. which read H8WE space J. So that's a personal plate. So her. that's how uh-huh. J. Yeah. So obviously Jeffrey Howe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um. So obviously it belonged to Jeffrey Howe. So they're like, why, why is it? Yeah. Yeah. Why is it in the cupboard? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um. And we we will find that out later. Um. So the officers made the decision at that point to leave the address, regroup, mm-hmm. and then the the um. Stephen and Sarah were arrested quite soon after that. So Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were taken to the Hatfield Police Station for questioning. While they were in custody, forensics, forensic experts began to do a proper evidence search of the flat. Mm-hmm. Um, but time was against them because if, if the police couldn't uh, obtain significant evidence, the pair would have to be released after 24 hours. Yeah. So Because uh-huh. at, at the moment, they've got nothing. They're well, just yeah. basically like, they seem dodgy. Yeah, they're, they're his tenants, they seem dodgy. So. And there's a car registration Yeah, so plate. they've not got any real evidence to sort of hold them for... Um, for any more than the, than the 24 hours, yeah. So, so, so ba- yeah, so basically, I mean, they were actually arrested for a murder that's happened, but the police didn't actually know if that murder had happened, because at this point, they still don't know if, if Jeffrey is dead. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. they're, they're, they're arresting some people for a murder, but they're like, we don't actually know if there has been a murder, but we're arresting them for murder anyway. Right. <laughs> um, so obviously that determines how long somebody can be kept in custody. Yeah, you know. Sure. So they needed to work fast to get the evidence because they hadn't gathered any evidence against them as individuals prior to their arrest which is basically what I've just said. Mm. So initially, when the police had first looked at the flat, it didn't ne- reveal that it was necessarily the murder scene because it was obviously been a proper clean-up mm-hmm. of the place because obviously they've had time to do yeah, it. Of course, yeah. But once they've started moving furniture around and pulling carpets up, the, 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 um, the forensic examination revealed that there was a quantity of blood in both the bedroom and the bathroom. Mm-hmm. So police believed that Jeffrey had been stabbed in the bedroom 
And then the dismemberment took place in the bathroom, which mm. obviously that, it makes sense, doesn't it? Totally. Um, so as workers worked around the clock at the crime scene, Detective Constable Sue Burns interviewed Stephen Marshall. She said that when she first met him, he came across as a nice, charming person and he kept it up through it, throughout the whole time in police custody. Mm-hmm. When he was being interviewed, though, he took up, took up his right to make no comment to every single question. Uh, so, to hide. yeah, Sue Burns said, well, if he hadn't murdered his friend, then why wasn't he telling me that he hadn't murdered his friend? Exactly. I'm totally saying, if he starts saying no comment, then to me, that's something to hide. Yeah, I mean, like, you, the lawyers do advise you to say no comment, even people that are innocent. Mm. But if you haven't murdered your friend, surely you could answer that question. Well, no, I haven't murdered my friend. Well, exactly, because you can't, that's not incriminating yourself. No. You're, you're, you're answering the question, you've generally not murdered somebody, then you'd... Surely want to state your case majorly. I have not done this. And I would like to help you find who has. Oh, well, yeah. But obviously not. Um, so as the, and as the interviews progressed, like she said that Stephen's guilt became more and more apparent. And while, while Sarah was interviewed, she gave an explanation and the police said it was queer, clearly a web of lies. I, I couldn't see what she had said, but the police yeah. were like, nah, don't believe you. Don't believe you. So now, although Sarah and... Stephen were in custody at this stage police hadn't been able to identify whether Jeffrey Howe was their victim or not so they were obviously they got a murder but they don't know if they have murdered their murder victim yeah, you know they've obviously yeah. murdered somebody in the flat because uh-huh. there's the blood in the room yeah. but they haven't identified so, that well, it's Jeffrey know. it could actually have been somebody else it could have been somebody else yeah they I mean stumbled across it by accident exactly it could have been but the likelihood is <laughs> I mean, it's Jeffrey's house, so... Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but obviously, we know that they have to get all yeah, the evidence and, you know, make a strong case. Yes. Um, so, a thorough search of his flat had failed to provide any suitable items t- to take DNA from. And although it was a family member of Jeffrey's who had phoned the incident room to say he, c- he could be the victim, Jeffrey was actually adopted, so there was no DNA like links could be established to his family. So, it was like they couldn't get Jeffrey's DNA. Yeah. <laughs> because, like, you know, if, if if he hadn't been adopted, they could have just took yeah, familial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and Dundee, forensic... <clears throat> sorry. Forensic anth- anthropologists were trying to take... Ta- blah, 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 blah. Right, okay, start that again. <laughs> <laughs> Rewind. <Cheap> <laughs> and Dundee, forensic anthropologists were trying to help police confirm the victim's identity. So what they did was get a photo of Jeffrey Howe and a CT scan of the skull and super, superimposed the photo onto the scan to try and establish a match. They could see the shape of the upper head matched, the position of the eyes matched, the hole, the hole where the nose sits, the width and length of that matched Jeffrey's nose and when looking at the teeth, the position of the lower incisors matched up to the incisors seen on the photograph and also the shape of the chin and the jawline matched as well. So this strongly suggested... That the skull belonged to Jeffrey, mm-hmm. and once an odontologist, odd, 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 what's that word? <laughs> o- odontologist. <laughs> okay, an odontologist, odonto- a dentist. For God's sake, right, right, right a dentist. Okay, we'll just go with that. <laughs> um, so once the dentist. <laughs> The specialist dentist, Just, we'll call him that. Oh yeah, specialist dentist. <laughs> match the teeth. So the match teeth with dental records. Jeffrey Howe was publicly identified as the victim on the 23rd of April. Cool. So it was definitely Jeffrey. Right. So the following day, Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were charged with murder and remanded in custody pending a trial date. But the investigation team team's work didn't end there. It was now down to other forensic experts to come up with evidence that would prove crucial when the case went to court. So Ray Palmer was analysing evidence to try and prove that Stephen Marshall was present at the time of the murder and the dismemberment took place. Because remember, they still haven't put the two together, yeah. you know, that it was them Aye. that murdered Jeffrey. Uh. So he wanted to focus pri- primarily on the tape used to wrap the plastic around the body parts. So basically, because the tape was on a roll, mm. there wouldn't have been any fibres on it until it was, like, opened up. Right. And then the adhesive would have been exposed to the environment. Mm-hmm. So fibres from Stephen Marshall's environment, wherever he was, would have got onto the tape when wrapping the body parts. 
So what he actually did was he, he sealed the evidence on the tape himself. Because the, 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 everybody came from his clothes, from, yeah. you know, the, the environment that he was in. So, uh-huh. note no to any, if you're going to if you're gonna wrap up body parts, don't use tape. I don't know what you're going to use. No. Rope, maybe. Maybe, but then there's not be fibres that go on the rope. Uh, I don't know. I don't think Just we should don't be. don't murder anybody. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we should be talking about um, murdering people because no. obviously we're not going to be doing it. And we hope that none of our listeners are going to be doing it either. Exactly. So, the various samples were removed and mounted onto acetate films to preserve the evidence. The fibres were so tiny that they were highlighted by red circles so that the uh, experts could examine them more easily. Ray found fibre collectives that he believed came from a blue object with a peach skin texture. So forensic officers at the murder scene looked for an item that fitted that description. It's very detailed, this. Yeah, it is very detailed. And the item, or items, should I say, were inflatable airbeds that Stephen and Sarah had bought after Jeffrey's death. Okay. Basically, they must have got rid. Ri- ri- they must have got rid of the bed because that's where they murdered um, Jeffrey. Uh-huh. So that would have been heavily blood stained. Uh-huh. So they bought air beds instead, and that's where the fibers came from that were on the tape that wrapped the body parts. Right. Okay. So having identified a match, um, there was further compelling evidence to link Stephen to the murder scene. So in addition to the already mentioned fibers. They found a number of green polyester fibres and green cotton fibres, which were subsequently found to match a green polo shirt that belonged to Stephen. Mm-hmm. So the evidence was overwhelming yeah. and placed Stephen Marshall at Jeffrey House flat mm-hmm. at the time the body was being dismembered and wrapped up. But while fibre evidence implicated Stephen as the murderer, back in Dundee, Sue Black and Lucina, Lucina Hackman were making some shocking discoveries about the body parts Mm -hmm. so sue said quote most dismemberments are unsuccessful or haphazard at best because most individuals do not appreciate how difficult it is to separate the human body Mm -hmm. so if you think right i'm going to take a leg off like how do you do it what do you just like cut across the thigh Mm -hmm. and you might cut across the tissue but once you get down to the bone that bone's obviously really tough you can't cut through it with a kitchen knife So in most dismemberments, we expect to find those elements that show this per- that this person didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. With the Jeffrey Howe case, they didn't find we didn't find that. Right. So, for example, most of us in the public would find it very difficult to find where that junction is between the lower end of our radius and ulnar, mm-hmm. which are on our forearm. Yeah. So it must be here. I'm showing you, and each of um, and the. Start of our carp- carpal bones, the radial carpal joint at the wrist. So basically, between like your forearm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not your wrist and your elbow. With- yeah. So most of us would make several attempts and wouldn't get it right. With and each one of those attempts would be recorded on the bone. Obviously, yeah, you'd get the marks because you'll have had that cut mark left. Stephen Marshall found it first time. End quote. So Lucinda said, "Quote the body." was dismembered at the joints. There was no cutting of the bone, and that's that's what takes the time in a dismemberment, is cutting through the bone. Right. You need an implement that will actually saw through the very large bones of the lower limbs, for example, and the larger bone of the upper limb. In this case, because the individual went through the joint capsules, all it meant was cutting through soft tissue and cartilage and then separating the body at those spaces. So the dismemberment could have been done in a couple of hours easily by someone who knew what they were doing. How do they know what he was doing? That's what I want to know. That's what everybody wants to know. <clears throat> Sorry. Sue also said, quote, I've been an anatomist for at least 25 years, I would say, and I've seen quite a number of dismemberment cases. I have never seen, ever seen anything at this level of skill that I think if I was given this task and I had to do this, would I have done this any differently? Uh-huh. And the answer is no. I wouldn't have done it any differently. He did it perfectly. And I w- and would I have done it any better? No, I couldn't have done it any better. You know, and as I said, she's been, for 25 years, she's mm. uh, been an, an anatomist. Wow. Um, so this is someone who, as an a- anatomist, sorry, I'm looking at an equal in terms of skill, and that's quite chilling, wow. end quote. So, of course, there were further questions for the police. They had to try and ex- establish whether or not Stephen had any background and knowledge 
of anatomy, mm-hmm. whether he it, it, it might have been a butcher or like a gamekeeper yeah. or something along those lines. Uh-huh. Um, but no evidential link was established there. So they're uh-huh. like, they're, th- this just left no logical explanation as to how Stephen had these skills uh-huh. and investigations into his past continued. Uh-huh. On the 1st of May 2009, Sarah and... Uh, Stephen appeared in Stevenage Magistrates Court and they both entered a plea of not guilty. And at the prosecution's request, it was January 2010 before the case went to trial. Just before the case started, both Stephen and Sarah needed to, pre- to present a, defa- a, a defence case statement. During that statement, Sarah claimed that Stephen had carried out the murder and Stephen claimed it was Sarah who carried out the murder. So, Blaming each other. Yeah, basically. Lovely relationship. Those two have got it. Eh? As we know, Stephen had originally entered a plea of not guilty to everything, but on the first day of the trial, he changed his plea and he admitted to dismembering the body, but he didn't admit it, admit to the murder. Okay. So he's basically saying that she murdered him but and he um, did the dismemberment, yeah. So as the, the case progressed, the prosecution witnesses painted a grim picture of Stephen's character. He was known to the police as he had a history of violence the court heard about the different levels of violence that he had used to a number of witnesses that gave evidence. He was described as a very manipulative, dangerous individual and just wouldn't bat an eyelid at turning to extreme violence. But some of the most compelling facts presented to the court focused on Stephen and Sarah's actions after the murder. Remember, I told you that he was stupid. Yes. Which had um, left a significant trail of evidence. So they were buying stuff with Jeffrey's money immediately after his death. He... He wasn't even dead a day and they were spending his money. So that wasn't particularly clever <laughs> because obviously that was always going to lead the police back to them. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, they're obviously thinking that they weren't going to find the body parts or they weren't going to identify yeah. Jeffrey. So they were obviously thinking they were going to get away with it. But mm-hmm. spend his money while they Yeah. Um, so they used his bank account to buy a laptop, shoes, takeaways... They set up an account with on t- online retailer Littlewoods, also using his bank account. They also sold some of Jeffrey's stuff, like his mobile phone, some furniture, and his car, which was sold on eBay. Oh, so the plates were in there. <clears throat> well, yeah, I was just about to tell you. Stephen swapped the number plate, so he put his own number plate on Jeffrey's car mm-hmm. and sold it. Right. And put um, but then he put. He was actually um, he was seen. Stephen was seen on CCTV putting petrol on his own car. And driving away without paying, and his car had Jeffrey's personalised number plate on it. So before he'd obviously took it off and put it in the wardrobe, right. he'd swapped them and put it on his own car, like, <laughs> and then got caught on CCTV because he never paid for his petrol. Well, <laughs> like nothing like keeping like the like a low profile. You know, you think I mean. Well, that's what I mean. It's just so stupid. Have you, you know, as we said, like the way that he's managed to dismember a body and has been clever about it, really, if you think about it, you know, well, maybe not so much with hiding them, but, like, putting them in different places yeah. and thinking, probably, that, oh, he's not going to be identified because of the way yeah, that he's yeah, done yeah. it, and then goes and does that. Well, yeah, I know, like... That's just stupid. That, oh. yeah, just, yeah. Criminals are stupid. Yeah, I've always said that. <laughs> um, so they wrote checks to themselves from Jeffrey's account, including one for fi- £850 deposited in Sarah's account, on the 12th of March, and another one deposited, <coughs> sorry, into Stephen's account for 99 99 well, See, that's just obvious, though. You just get your trail of evidence. <laughs> exactly. Why all of a sudden is he paying checks into your tenants' accounts? I mean... Especially when the tenants are actually due him money for rent. Well, exactly. And so, basically, they managed to steal about £5,000 from Jeffrey in total. I mean, £5,000, that's... Yeah, it's a lot of money, mm-hmm. but it's not a lot of money when it, if you think about what they've done to get that yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. They've killed somebody for £5,000. Yeah, That's exactly. awful. That is terrible. Um, after three weeks in court, uh, the case for the prosecution was coming to a close, and before Stephen and Sarah were called to the stand, Stephen pled guilty to murder. So because of him pleading guilty to murder, the murder charge for Sarah was withdrawn. Right. So she had pled not guilty to everything at the start, so when Stephen pleaded guilty to murder, she then admitted some lesser charges. So she admitted to helping dispose of the body parts and to giving the police false information about the whereabouts of a missing person. Right. So having admitted to Jeffrey Harry's murder, Stephen then stunned the court as, as he made an astonishing revelation. 
His involvement in gangland murders re was revealed to the court on the 1st of February 2010 by his defence barrister, who said that Stephen had learned to cut up bodies because he'd done it before. Not once, but four times. Apparently, he helped dispose of victims of gangland executions while he worked as a nightclub doorman in the mid-90s. Oh, wow. So that's how he learned oh. to cut up bodies. Oh, lovely. But I just don't understand, like, why they decided to tell people them that in court that that what that didn't need to be said well especially from his defense lawyer <laughs> exactly and i don't understand if the prosecution found that <laughs> and he revealed that but your defense lawyer that's just like slinging you under the bus there isn't it <laughs> yeah it just it just doesn't like why you, you didn't need to to give out that information so i have no idea why mm. that was said but i mean that's quite horrible because then he's obviously been involved in other yeah but murders. um that was sort of looked into and nothing nothing sort of came of it, so I don't know. Um, and I didn't really go into no. it because I was like, well, that's nothing to do with this, because this no. is Jeffrey Howe's yeah, case, you know. Exactly. Um, so with Stephen and Sarah now not having to take the stand, sentencing swiftly followed. Sarah was sentenced for perverting the course of justice, and she got three years and nine months. Stephen got a life sentence with a minimum of 36 years. She got off quite well. Well, yeah, I thought that. I thought, well, he's got 36 years, which is, that's a good sentence for yeah, yeah. murder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because life sentence is usually about 25 years and then, yeah. you know, with your parole, you maybe get less than that. But 36 years, a minimum of 36 years. Yeah, no, that's good. But she was obviously there. Yeah, like, I mean, it was obviously... She And why didn't why didn't she get... I mean, um, how many times has, um, you know, in, in past cases where if, like, somebody's there and they've maybe not done the act of the murder but because they've been there they've still been charged with it they've been like and they've got more more than that yeah but but i think she was there she admitted to help disposing of the body or body parts should i say mm. she stole his money so where's the theft mm. charge mm. as well which probably wouldn't have been that much but you know i just think yeah, that because yeah. i mean she would probably i mean she might well like, serve or have she, served like what a year or two in prison, yeah maybe? exactly she probably didn't serve very much so I mean, like, I think she, I she mean, got she, a let off lightly. Yeah, I was going to say, she obviously didn't deserve as much as... Um, no, of course not. St Stephen. But she was there. She, well, we don't know what the extent of what she did, hmm. but she was still there. She could, you oh. know, she didn't tell the police. She exactly. stole this. She helped dispose of the body parts. She stole his money. She, you know, kept it from the police. So she deserved more than that. Yeah. But 36 years, he definitely wow. deserved that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's a good sentence. So. Yeah. So thank you to everybody for coming back and listening once again. Mm. And I'm just about to lose my voice. <clears throat> good title, is it? When we're just about to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, so if um, you would like to join our Patreon, there's bonus content over there, some extra episodes. Um, go to patreon.com slash crownedhours. If you'd like to get in contact with us or follow us on social media, our details are in the show notes. And if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, review. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.